So here's a shocker that'll play havoc with your mind. The February 2014 issue of the British Medical Journal published a very important study showing that the trials from the 1960s to the 1980s that indicated mammogram screenings reduced deaths from breast cancer and as a result have been the accepted gold standard for all of these years have now been uncovered as incorrect. In fact, a recent Canadian prospective clinical trial outcome shows that mammograms discover more cancers, which lead to unnecessary overtreatment. However, the mortality rate for women who have mammograms is no different from those who don't. Wow, say that again, Vicki. That's a big statement. The mortality rate for women who have mammograms is no different from those who don't have mammograms. That is a shocker. So the conclusion of the study is that mammograms do not save lives. Wow. And this is a 25-year study on 90,000 women out of Canada. This is a big deal. And what it does is it it goes back to show that the way you collect your data and the kind of research that you do makes a difference. This study, I should say the bulk of the studies that have been done that have led to our saying that we're reducing the deaths from breast cancer by 15 to 25 percent in women aged 50 to 70, those studies were done in in what's called a retrospective study, which means the studies have already been done. Then you go back and collect the information and hope that when they compared the groups in the studies that they were looking for, what what they did was actually have no bias, meaning no differences that are significant in the groups they were comparing. But when you do a prospective study, which is a different kind of study, where you take one group of people that are homogeneous, one big mixed up group of people, and divide it into two sections and then follow them over 25 years for a single endpoint, like in the case of mammography. You you do mammograms on one group, the other group you don't, but the groups are the same. You track them for 25 years, and lo and behold, they find out that those findings, that all the other studies and the meta-analyses that were done were not right. Well, what did the old study show about how mammograms saved lives? Wasn't it one life saved out of 5,000 mammograms? Somewhere between 2,500 and 5,000 mammograms need to be done to save one life. You're looking at numbers that are really And that was with the old statistics. Those are the statistics we go by. And there's all this hullabaloo for that, so you've got to do a lot of mammograms. And when you do, and then you overdiagnose them besides, because when you look at the two groups that they looked at, okay, in this Canadian study, one study, one group had uh, a fixed number of, well, they had a certain number of deaths. And that was the group that had the mammograms over that period of time. And it turned out that that group found more cancers, about 22% more cancers, than in the group that had no mammograms at all. But weren't a lot of those false positives? No. Those were the ones that were the real cancers. So 22% more cancers found, real cancers, invasive cancers. Did it include the DCIS? No, it didn't even include those, which makes it skewed even worse because those aren't really cancers at all. So what I'm saying here to make a short sentence out of this is that the group that had mammography over the 25 years had 22% more cancers found than the group that didn't have mammography. So what is that telling you? Some cancers disappear on their own, and they don't need to be treated. So when they say there's a 15 to 25% reduction in deaths, they're talking about those people that would have been cured anyway. So what does the mammogram do? It makes trouble. Well, I think most of us know that we get cancer cells that come and go frequently. Yeah, that's for sure. But these are real cancers. I'm not talking about cancer cells. I'm talking about invasive cancers where you go to the pathologist and say, is this serious? And he says, you darn right it is. But a lot of those cancers, they disappear. Another study was done years ago, four or five years ago, on 100,000 women who got mammograms on year one, year three, and year five. And they found 2,000 cancers. Another group had mammograms at the end of five years, another 100,000 women. 
There were only 1,500 cancers found in that group. How do you explain that? Because 500 some of, them, some of them went away on their own then. Yeah, about 25%. The same numbers they're talking about here, they're taking credit for because they think they've cured them. But and nobody it, wants to take that gamble. So if well, they have if they have a mammogram well, done right. and it shows that they have a cancer, of course, they don't want to think, oh, I'm going to just sit, sit and pray and hope that it's going to disappear. Okay, so what are you better off doing then if you're the, the governing agency, the, the medical doctors, the AMA or whoever they are that decides what tests should be done? What would you recommend that they say? It would be simple. Don't do a mammogram because the 22%, you're not going to overdiagnose them and they're not going to live any longer anyway. So what's the drill for it? What does it accomplish? Nothing except it makes more people get mammograms, get treatment or with makes radiation, it. chemotherapy and surgery. Makes money. Well, that's what it's about. And so you look at, at the conclusion, okay, of what this Canadian study said and they're saying it's not an easy task to make the people of this country aware that we shouldn't be doing mammograms. They can't recommend them because governments, research funders, scientists, medical practitioners may have vested interest in continuing activities that are well established. Amen. That's what's happening. Well, also, can't the mammograms, the radiation from the mammograms, cause the breast cancer? Yes. but So if a woman has a tendency to have breast cancer or she has a cancer gene, mm -hmm. and then the, the doctors say, oh, it's really important to get frequent mammograms yeah. to, to follow you, yeah. couldn't they, in fact, be causing the cancer that they're trying to follow, follow to get it early? You'd have to think that. Yeah, sure, that would so be So maybe they wouldn't even have gotten it, but the, or maybe wouldn't have gotten it so soon, but okay. if they were getting the radiation that's so concentrated in that particular area, they could be increasing their risk. Of, of course, it. it would be. I would never have my patients who had, say, the BRCA gene defect get a mammogram. That's just insanity. But do you think that this is going to get the proper exposure in the media? I mean, there's... No, of course not. People are brainwashed already about getting mammograms. I mean, people want to follow the bandwagon. Um, they're afraid. They, they, they listen to the ads. The celebrities talk about it. Doctors talk about it. The Internet. The, there's prizes given to people for, for some. I, I, I saw something on TV not too long ago where the prize was to get a free mammogram. Oh, there's geez. political pressure. Yeah. I mean, there's conflict of interest. But people, There's a lot of money The involved, hardest you know. thing is that people are already believing that mammograms save lives. And that's a lot of what these cancer walks are about. Yeah, of course. And runs well, and well, all the at, other Look things. at all the money involved and who sponsors the cancer walks, the people that have the most to gain from it. You're looking at, at things from the American Cancer Society and you think, oh, they're a sacred organization. They're here trying to protect against uh, us dying from breast cancer. And so let's find the cure for cancer. Well, who do you think funds them? It's the pharmaceutical industry. And why do they do that? Because they make a ton of money when more people get mammograms because more people are going to get chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery. That's money in their back pocket. So, of course, we don't want to get breast cancer, but when is it useful to get a mammogram? Well, there are times. I'm not saying don't ever do a mammogram. I think it's a useful test for some things, but not as a screening test on people who are asymptomatic that's what causes all these problems. You find a lump, get a mammogram, see what it shows. It gives you some, some kind see, of idea of what's there. See, then a lot of people there. say, well, then it's too late if you find the lump. Well, it might be too late, but that, what else can you do? You need a better test because it's not going to be a mammogram. Let's go back and take a look at this question of radiation, too, and its, and its cause of cancer, and look at, at how much different uh, the number of cases is that get cancer, depending on how you test for it. One in 9,000 mammograms will lead to a lethal cancer. About one in 1,500 mammograms will cause a breast cancer. But you won't die from it except one in 9,000. You're going to save a life every 2,500 to every 5,000 mammograms. What kind of numbers are we talking about here? And who's taking advantage of women? those are the old numbers anyway, right? Those are, those are good numbers. Those numbers are fine. 
but but who's going to benefit from all that? Not very many people. And so we're spending billions of dollars to try and stop the epidemic of breast cancer as though it's going to be screening and early detection that solves the problem. That's insanity. Of course, what we should be doing is trying to prevent breast cancer. And don't think we don't know how to do that. Well, and a lot no of this fix. follows with what we were just talking about, too, with these walks and so forth that they're, that they're promoting, because a lot of this is about what we call pink washing. Go yeah. to our site, drsaputa.com, and oh, put yeah. in pink washing. Or go to the safecosmetics.org and put, and put it in, because a lot of these companies that are sponsoring these walks and things, they, they make products and manufacture products that actually contain the carcinogens that cause the breast cancer. Yeah, well, who cares if you're hypocritical as long as you're making a buck? Well, That's what the bottom say, line yeah, is. Yeah, and then people that have cancer, sometimes they're offering to give them gifts of makeup and stuff because they've had chemo and they've lost their hair and their eyelashes and their eyebrows, and so they give them cosmetics, but the cosmetics they give them have cancer-causing ingredients in them. Yeah, well, that's right. That's exactly what's happening, and it's wrong. And people need to pay attention to where their money goes when they buy something that says for a pink ribbon. Oh, yeah. Because a lot of that is just a... A gimmick to get you to buy things, so you well, can't really trust it. Well, everybody buys into it. And you start talking like, yeah, this. and you go to the cash register, and they say, "Would you like to donate to this?" Oh, you yeah, know? and then you beat up on the poor person at the cash register who thinks you're a nut too because you won't give a buck to pre- help women to pre- to cure breast cancer. And that's not what's what is happening. No, it's not where it's going. No, the, we should go towards the cure. We know how to cure breast cancer. I mean, how to how to die, how to prevent breast cancer. We can prevent breast cancer right this second. And it's all about lifestyle. And the, and the toxic environmental uh, compounds that we put in there, there are 100,000 new chemicals in the environment that are changing the genetic makeup that we have. The epigenetics of disease is more important than the genetics by far. If you have the BRCA gene defect, yes, you're at a higher risk for getting breast cancer, but you may never trigger those genes to go off. They never went off 100 years ago because there weren't 100,000 new chemicals that that change some of those genes to become toxic. Of course, some of these chemicals, it's it's difficult to avoid them. Well, you can't. I, I was just talking to a friend of mine on the phone today that was on an airplane, and she said this mist oh, came yeah. into the airplane. Oh, yeah, I know. And she's been having a sinus infection ever since. In fact, she said her throat cracked right up immediately as soon as that happened. And we were just on a trip, and I was walking through the restaurant, and I felt this mist come over me yeah. and asked somebody what it was, and they said, oh, it's to keep the insects away. Yeah. Well, so there are a lot of things that are very difficult but to prevent ourselves, but we need to prevent the things that we have the control over anyway. Well, we don't have control over a lot of it, and we're not smart enough to do what we can to take care of ourselves. I'm talking about epigenetics. What's that? Genetics is DNA. DNA is not the boss. DNA gives you options. The environment does a lot, and your lifestyle does a lot to determine whether those cancer genes are going to be turned on or off. If they're turned off, you don't have a problem. Like 100 years ago, the BRCA gene defect didn't make that much difference. That's what Angelina Jolie had. Right. But Angelina Jolie now comes out like she's some kind of authority. I mean, she's a marvelous actress. Uh, I love to watch her. She's terrific. Beautiful. As an actress, but what the hell? I mean, a piece in the New York Times uh, that Angelina Jolie says this, give me a break. We need to be looking at what we can do in our lifestyle to take responsibility for our health. Eat a healthy diet so you have the nutrients that you need to be able to prevent the cancers from developing because they have. we have the products that we need to build our defenses. Get enough sleep. We know that sleep's a problem. We're going to talk about that later in the show. Uh, we know that if you don't exercise... A lot of things happen because toxins build up and a lot of other things happen. So we need to make sure that we're doing the things that we can to take care of ourselves. And that's a no-brainer and straightforward. We know that today. Nobody would argue with that. You know, we didn't mention much about the DCIS. Do you want to touch on that? Sure. I mean, DCIS is another problem in itself. Ductal carcinoma in situ. Right. And, And that's something that wasn't included in this study that was done. Uh, up in Canada. Which was a good thing, huh? Well, it it it, it just showed how bad uh, the other studies that we have have been, and it took away the most powerful piece of 
uh, literature that we have that would have supported it even more. So it makes the study even better. Ductal carcinoma in situ is not cancer 98% of the time. 2 to 3% of the ductal carcinomas in situ will go on and kill you. The other 97 to 98%, you'll die with but not from. So it's not a big issue. But if you've got DCIS uh, and your doctor says, well, you've got a 2 or 3% chance of dying, what do you want to do? Nearly everybody, especially with the encouragement of their oncologist, uh, is going to be doing treatment for it. And so they wind up with surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy that 97 to 98% of the time is not necessary. Who benefits from that? All the, the people that are in the business. That's right. The industry does. Now, you could track these people over time, not with a mammogram and not with a CT scan and not with any fancy uh, digital procedures that we do. But with a breast thermography. You could use breast thermography and you could use MRIs. I mean, they're fine. Now, the breast thermography you can afford because it's like 150 or $200 or Same something like that. Same as a like mammogram. That. Same as a mammogram. And the MRIs, of course, are quite expensive. And when you do the MRIs in certain ways, they require a dye as well, which can be toxic and cause problems that are a real issue. So we're really left with what? Breast thermography. And who on the planet thinks breast thermography is good? Well, for one... Not the mammographers. <laughs> no, but for one... The FDA in 1982 said it was fine as an adjunct to mammography. So what's all the hullabaloo about? Because they don't want to learn how to do it. Well, that's part of it. And there was a study that was done that was the biggest study on 283,000 women back in 1982, which at the time, breast thermography was not an advanced study. And they found that after a couple of years, they didn't do it anymore. Because they said it just made more trouble. And at the time, that might have been true. But, I mean, just like mammograms have gotten better, so have, so have the people who do breast thermography. And it's a very good science now. And why people won't look at the research there and the data that's been on, on 300,000 women is beyond me and because we it's good we stuff. Have, we have it all over drsaputo.com. So if anybody wants to learn more about breast thermography, it's easy to, to find it if you just put it in the search box. Well, that's right. So we've got a problem. There is a solution. There are many solutions to it. But it's going to be very difficult for the public to wake up and for doctors to wake up and change their thinking that says mammograms aren't a good idea. And here's the data that shows it. And you're going to find a whole bunch of people coming up with all kinds of reasons trying to say, well, this study wasn't right, but it is. They're going to say it's not right because they've got a conflict of interest that's going to support them to do something more because it's, it's, it's somehow providing them with income. Change isn't easy. 